Hello everyone, I hope you are all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Alan Dreffler, who is an astronomer emeritus at Carnegie Institution for Science of Washington, DC. My name is Paula Ronco, and together with Thomas Puzia, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, simultaneous language interpretation is provided by Patricio Gonzalez, who will be simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos, pueden escuchar la interpretación al español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar español. We would like to acknowledge the general support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym. Thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. Um, if you're watching this talk on YouTube, please leave your comments below. Mm -hmm. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series, please send us your feedback by email. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window. You can also upvote questions and also comment on them, and we will select then the best questions for the discussion after the talk. This is just a reminder that the link of the live version of this video will be automatically taken down by YouTube shortly after the streaming is over. However, the final high resolution version, both in English and Spanish, will be uploaded to our channel in the next few weeks. So before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our other panel members that are with us here today. Alan, of course, our speaker, Patricio, our interpreter, Paula and myself. And then from the faculty um, of the Institute of Astrophysics, we have Patricia Ticera, Gaspar Galas, and our director, Felipe Barrientos. We also have from the Institute of Astrophysics, Tuila Ziliotto, who is a new graduate student at the Institute, Demetra de Chico, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute, and Elizabeth Arto de la Villamoa, who is also a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute. We also have the great pleasure to welcome our guest panelists today. So we have Valentina Abril, who is a recent PhD from ex Marcel University and an upcoming postdoctoral fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Yara Jafé, who is a professor of astronomy at the Institute, uh, the Instituto de Física y Astronomía of the University of Valparaíso. Rohan Rahad Guancar, who is a research intern at Gemini Observatory. Miguel Rowe, a representative in Chile of the Giant Magellan Telescope Organization. We also have Mauricio Paolillo, a professor of physics and astronomy at the Department of Physics at Tori Pantini of Universitat degli Stadi Federico II. Uh, Tomas Otreu, he's a professor of astronomy at the University of California in Los Angeles. And also we have Gustavo Bruzual, who is an astronomer at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And last but not least, we also have our excellent QA manager, Ricardo Acevedo. So it is our great pleasure to introduce Alan Dressler as our, as our golden webinar speaker today. Alan received his bachelor in physics in 1970 from the University of California, Berkeley. And in 1976, his PhD in astronomy from the University of California in Santa Cruz. He then advanced his, with his uh, research as a Carnegie Fellow, and after that he stayed here in Chile with the Las Campanas Fellowship. In 1981, he returned to the United States and became a staff astronomer at Carnegie Institution for Science of Washington, D.C., where finally was elected a, as an astronomer emeritus. In 1983, Alan was awarded with the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize in Astronomy from the American Astronomical Society, and in 1999, he received the Public Survey Medal from NASA. In 2017, the Aura Hubble Space Telescope and Beyond Committee, chaired by Alan, received the Carl Sagan Memorial Award, which is given to an individual or group who has demonstrated leadership in research or policies advancing exploration of the cosmos. Alan's area of research is the formation and evolution of galaxies, focusing on what leads to the diversity of different types and properties, including such as uh, galaxy environment and interactions. To carry out his studies, Alan has used large ground-based telescopes, such as the Magellan Telescope, and space telescopes, such as the Hubble and Spitzer Space Telescopes. He was a co-principal investigator in the project known as the MORPS, 
which focused on the evolution of spiral galaxies over the last 7 billion years. This group found that the star formation was more common in galaxies 5 billion years ago than it is today, and that much of this star formation occurred in starbursts, in contrast to the more steady star formation seen today. She was also a principal contributor to a study how, of how uniform and expand, the expansion of the universe is in our galactic neighborhood. This research led to the identification of the great attractor, an enormous concentration of galaxies and invisible matter whose gravity appears to be pulling our Milky Way and its neighbors. Alan was also involved in instrumentation. He led the effort for the Inamori Magellan Aerial Spectrograph, also known as IMAX, a wide field imager and multi-object spectrograph which became operational in 2003 on the Bath Telescope at the Carnegie Las Campanas Observatory. His work with IMAX continued when he became a member of the IMAX Cluster Building Survey, ICBS collaboration, which follows the evolution of over 10,000 galaxies in old rich clusters. So now we hand it over to Alan, who will tell us all about exploring origins and seeing the birth of galaxies with the James Webb Space Telescope. Alan, the audience is yours. Welcome, everybody. Well, we've heard the title and everything, so I think I'll move right to the subject. This is going to be about galaxies. They are the building blocks of the universe we have today. They are the building blocks for very many reasons, for many reasons. For one, they are the homes of the stars. The stars are making the chemical elements, you know. Everything we know in life are made. The planets orbit the stars. All this takes place in the galaxies. And the galaxies are spread across the sky. They are ubiquitous. And so in these very simple ways, we can say that they are the building block. However, this ignores the dynamism that goes on in a galaxy. Stars are being born in galaxies in many kinds of environments. The stars age. The stars have different ways of dying, like the supernova explosion. And the gas that they expel when they die winds up back in the galaxy to make new stars. And this cycle continues for most galaxies over their lifetime. So a galaxy is an engine. It's a machine turning out amazing stuff. All the complexity in the universe, which is everything we're interested in, is, is there because of galaxies. And it's the reason that our universe has a future. If there were no galaxies, if there was a universe of no galaxies, there would have been no future because it would have just been Big Bang, inflate, hot, expand, cool, done, Finish. No golden webinars. Here's a kind of a typical galaxy. Um, it's very hard to get a sense of galaxies. They are so beyond human scale. There are about 100 billion stars in a typical galaxy. That number itself is not extraordinary. There are 8 billion people on Earth, so we can assign 30 stars to every Earthling. We kind of count for that. It's really in the size of galaxies that our senses completely overwhelmed. The sun is eight light minutes away from us. That's how long it takes light to travel. Uh, its nearest neighbor is a few light years away, but a galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And one makes attempts to put this in human scale. For example, if I was the size of a, a star, then my nearest neighbor would be on the other side of the Earth. That's real social distancing. And in that scaling, uh, the galaxy would be about the size of the solar system. And, you know, I don't have any better feeling for that than when we started. So you just have to imagine that they're enormous things way beyond human scale. Uh, and you just deal with it. If you're an astronomer, you stop thinking about it. I should mention just there is a disk in most galaxies that are forming stars where um, gas and dust are mixing and condensing to make stars. Uh, a bulge um, in many galaxies. The glow that we see here looks like it's uh, some sort of gas, but no, it's the light of individual stars. And in fact, as I said, they're far away from each other, and yet so many and so hard to resolve that it just looks like the whole galaxy glows. And then one more thing. There is a dark halo of dark matter 
that this galaxy and all galaxies sit in, and it controls the formation of such a galaxy, but after that plays very little role, maybe no role, in the things I'll be talking about today. So galaxies are actually, a, you know, why do I call them building blocks? They are the critical step to life. It's pretty much what we care about. In two ways, building structure in the universe, they are the thing that took the universe from a very smooth universe. Here's a picture of the sky, as we would see it 400,000 years after the Big Bang, except it doesn't, it looks too flat, because there are ripples in that picture. These are microwaves that come to us from that time. And those ripples are sort of one part in 100,000. It's quite smooth. But at three, three billion years after the Big Bang, Quite a bit longer. This is a picture of the universe we see with all the galaxies and all the structure. So something has happened here in this period that has made the basic structure of these building blocks as I've talked about. And then inside those galaxies are all kinds of things going on with starbirth as we talked about. On another fundamental level though, uh, galaxies are enabling chemical evolution. We have generations of stars that through fusing light elements into heavy elements are producing light, but generating the heavier elements in the chemical table, so including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all those things. And this chemical evolution is allowed to build because we live in a galaxy. Again, if there was with no such thing as a galaxy like this, or it was much more tentatively, tenuously held together, that previous generations of heavy elements would not accumulate to make stars that were more and more dense. And we would not reach the levels that have made it that are critical for having planets and life. So a little bit more about the structure. Galaxies are spread across the sky. This is a picture made of individual galaxy locations, a map of galaxies across the sky. Every map, every point here is a, is a galaxy. And we're down in this point uh, looking out on this. Now, this lacy sort of filamentary structure was noticed about 30 years ago, and we now have computer sim simulations of the cosmic web, as we call it. Um, this shows glowing filaments that match pretty well the picture you're seeing of the galaxy map. Um, and that, but this is just the distribution of dark matter. They're glowing because of the way the picture is co uh, colored, but it's not the galaxies we're seeing, just the, the dark matter. But it, mimics the structure very well. Here's a little movie showing uh, three-dimensionally how this happens, how we go from the smooth universe to one that's clustered together by Kratzoff and Klippen. Uh, this structure, which is how we get these filaments, arises because of gravity pulling on everything, pulling on everything else, but also, and critically, because the universe is expanding. And it's that expansion plus contraction in places that gives rise to this filamentary structure. That was 13 million years and 22 seconds, but we don't have much time, so I'm connected with that. The other thing you need to know for this talk, looking back in time, this is a key element. Andromeda is the closest big galaxy to us. Even that is 2 million light years away. So uh, we see what Andromeda looked like uh, long before humans were on the Earth. Well, we can just look further away and to relative size, we see that galaxies tens of millions of light years look kind of like that, hundreds of millions. And finally, here's a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope called the Deep Field, in which you can see things that are a billion light years away, and therefore a billion years back in time, and sorry, a billion years after the Big Bang. And uh, no, I did say that wrong. We see things that are uh, a billion years after the Big Bang is the kind of smallest things on this picture, and other things are many billions of years after the Big Bang and many billions of years back for us. There are, as Thomas said, different types of galaxies, and one of the fundamental questions in the field has been, is the type of a galaxy destined from early in its formation or are galaxies transformed from one type to another later? And how can we begin to answer that question? Uh, I put in a little cultural reference here. Yogi Berra said you can observe a lot just by looking. And our means of doing that has been the Hubble Space Telescope. We can attack that problem, which was born in 1990. It had to be repaired. 
but 30 years later, it's still going strong and it is a rich source of science progress in astronomy. If you would take that Hubble Space Telescope deep image, the ultra deep field, and parse it up into galaxies at different look back times in the past, here's us today, 13 billion years, age of the universe. 10 billion years, that's a few billion years from looking back from us, and we could still see the shapes of galaxies pretty well, pretty well before there was Hubble. But Hubble opened the door to going much, much further back in time. And so we were seeing things that were only a few billion years old. And you can see how things change. Well, this is a little one way to sort of sense the, 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 the movement of things. But how do I know I'm looking back that far? Well, because the universe is expanding further out in space, is further back in time. And therefore, if we can measure, because of the expansion, the shift that happens to the light, it's sort of like the Doppler shift. But it's because of the expansion of the universe. We can see that the light shifts to the red and the greater the shift, the greater the distance to that group of galaxies. So that's pretty much how we get our distances, excuse me. Now, whenever this picture is shown, there comes up a question. How can we look out into space and see things all around us that are older? when the universe was smaller when it was older. It's a conundrum that is all wrapped up into the fact that the universe is not three-dimensional. It has dimensions of time and space. So when we look out, we're seeing not the whole universe, not any of it, all of it, but a shell, if you will, of a certain time whose light has just reached us now. So when we look out, we see things, and it's all around us because those are the gal those galaxies were all around us when the light was emitted. So we look out, and in the sky, we can see things spread that are much earlier time, normal galaxies, but quite a far back, the Hubble Deep Field and this ultra deep field I just showed. And then beyond to what we're going to talk about later, first galaxies, maybe even first stars, those are going to be hard to see, and then the universe before it even had galaxies. So this just by looking, well, yes, we could see something quite remarkable here today, uh, galaxies that are about halfway back in the universe. And you can see many familiar types we see today. But as you look further back to time five billion years after the Big Bang, you begin to see many more irregular looking things. And if you look at this last panel, four billion years after the Big Bang, well, then galaxies are looking very different. So this is quite an amazing thing. We have pictorial evidence from the Hubble that the universe is changing, that it has evolved. And that is something we never had before Hubble took these pictures. But it doesn't really answer the question about whether the types of galaxies were set up early or uh, much later in time, because we don't know how to connect the dots. We don't know whether these galaxies are going to turn into the elliptical galaxies like we see here or the spirals. We're not going to be able to get it just by looking, but it is wonderful to know that we can show that the universe is evolving. So if we can't tell from pictures, but we do have a way of studying individual galaxies and learning how have they grown over time. And the answer is we use the stars that make up the galaxies at clocks. So let's talk about how galaxies grow. It's a scientific program that involves a lot of physics and astronomy. Still, it's a subject much like studying the growth of human beings. In both, the goal is to find out, understand, what are the controlling factors that influence growth. This graph shows the growth of girls and boys with age from birth to 12 years old. Growth is nearly identical. This is sort of the 5%, 95% of the sample. Uh, but after that, you see that uh, girls have a bit of a spurt, and then boys continue to grow longer than girls. It's a little bit more obvious in this picture to the right. I'll stop using my cursor like that, which shows you how rapidly boys and girls were growing as a as function of their age. And you can see this remarkable fact that uh, when you were a baby, you were growing at the rate of 30 inches a year at one point. But it didn't last for very long, fortunately. Uh, and by the time you were a year old, you were growing more like 10 inches a year. 
And now it's been about, it, it was for the rest of your growth, it was about four or five inches per year. But you see what happens at the end. It's very clear now. Girls go through an earlier growth spurt. I remember that from high, from high school. And when the girls got taller and then the boys come later, but they have a longer growth spurt. And that's why there is that difference. So this describing the average growth rate of people is somewhat satisfied, but it doesn't tell us much about what's regulating that growth. Those simple statistics don't say anything about illness in the first 18, 18 years, malnutrition, genetics, anything. Average growth rates obscure the biological and the cultural factors that influence or control growth. The same is true for galaxies. People grow through eating. It's a chemical conversion process, galaxies grow by converting enormous amounts of hydrogen gas concentrated by gravity into generations of stars. The gravity comes first from this mysterious dark matter halo, and then from the ordinary atomic matter as it cools, it gets denser, it sinks further into the halo of the galaxy. So here's a remarkable diagram that was made, oh, between 10 and 20 years ago. Astronomers had succeeded in measuring how rapidly galaxies were forming stars in samples, I'll talk about that in a minute, in samples all the way, all across the universe in both space and time. They had just typical galaxies at different times and in different localities. They discovered that this star formation rate for all galaxies averaged together grew a factor of 20 times rate grew by 20 times from this early time, there's a little Big Bang symbol, to a peak at what we call cosmic noon. And that's back about uh, seven or eight, I guess eight or nine billion years in the past or three billion years from the start. Once it reached that peak where galaxies were forming stars like MAD, it has fallen a factor of 10 to today. And that's because the universe is running out of gas. So most cons astronomers consider this a triumph. I count myself in that number. And then many other pronounced that the problem of galaxies uh, forming stars was solved. We knew all about it. Not everybody thought that it was over. Having the average growth rate of galaxies said nothing about why and how they grow. The same thing we found for the statistics of people growing. We want to know this. The way forward is to use stars as clocks, like they said. How do we do that? Well, we have some advantages. Stars are all born in clusters from hundreds of thousands, hundreds of stars, thousands, up to millions of stars at a time. And this is a picture of two typical types of galaxy clusters. And this is a picture of a merging galaxy where all these are clusters. Uh, stars are forming very rapidly. Fortunately, stars are born in clusters and very much in the same way, whenever and wherever you see them. This main sequence of stars was discovered around 1910 by Hertzsprung and Russell. And it says that there is a relationship, very strong and tight relationships between a star's temperature, color, and brightness. And in this diagram, we have on this end, very massive stars, much more massive than the sun, with very short lifetimes. They are fusing light elements into heavy ones at a very rapid place rate. And then the sun in the middle here, it has a 10 billion year lifetime. We're halfway through it. And then stars that are much less massive than the sun that are, in fact, uh, they have lifetimes that are well over the age of the universe. So this little diagram in itself shows you how things, how we can use uh, this relationship to date how old uh, a star cluster is. Because as the star, after the star cluster forms, the most massive stars begin to uh, move over to the right and they go to supernova explosions. And then the main sequence begins to empty out as more and more stars move off the main sequence until finally you have stars like the sun, which have a much quieter death where they expel their gas into space and turn into white like dwarfs. So while this is going on, while there is this march down the main sequence, the spectrum of the whole cluster, if you just take the light from all the cluster, it changes. 
And when you see the light from the youngest stars, it's a very young cluster, only a million or two million years old, it will be dominated by those brightest stars, and they will have a very blue spectrum. Here's the rainbow from our sun. See how much stronger the light is in a cluster that's only a few million years old. As things age, we get down to stars that are sort of a billion years old. This is the rainbow we would see. And then finally, when we get down to the sun, which is here, or the giant stars that are uh, moving off the main sequence into this clump of stars in the HR diagram, begin to look all the same. So like clockwork, a newborn star cluster ticks down. The massive stars leave the main sequence, and the last ma less massive, and then the less, and the spectrum evolves as that happens. So our problem is that if we're going to look at a galaxy, we have all this stuff added together. We want to extract the histories from observations where all the light is mixed together. And the many stellar populations that have been born have different ages. And the light we uh, observe comes from a mix of them all together. So this is actually one of the many star clusters you could see populating this galaxy. And this is a picture of the Orion Nebula just to show you what it looks like in our galaxy. But there's star clusters all over the place. And they all have this signature of their ages. How do you figure out what the history was of making those star clusters? So the secret is to see what the rainbow of colors looks like for different ages. And you see it 1 million years, 10 million years, 100 million years. It changes, it changes. And one gig a year, 1 billion years, that is, uh, it looks very different that it did all the way along. However, when you get to two giga years and older, they all look alike. Very, very interesting. And that's because the stars, the light is coming from the same part of this uh, HR diagram. But the fact that the spectrum doesn't change after for stars older than two giga years means that once you get a cluster that's that old, you can't tell how old it is, or a galaxy that's that old, because uh, all the stars just look alike in terms of their spectrum. And that's the reason, largely, that the field of galaxy star formation histories, if you start from where we are today, hasn't gotten very far. Because if you look back two billion years, it doesn't look very different than it is today. And indeed, uh, it's been these galaxies have been slowing down. So there isn't very much to learn. Everything happened long before that. So there is a way around this. But the idea is to go back in time and then look from there uh, when you have a better leverage on the ages of the stars. This is a study I did with Dan Kelson and Louis Abramson, studying the star formation histories, focusing not on you know, the galaxy, the average galaxy, but in fact, trying to extract the star formation history of individual galaxies. So in this picture that we showed earlier, uh, of the average rate of star formation across the universe. It suggests that the average galaxy, they all would be participating in this sort of slowdown here. And indeed, when you investigate this last two gig years from today, you don't see anything remarkable. You see galaxies that seem to be slowing down and not much to it. However, if you look a little further back in this region, you see stars that are forming stars very rapidly. Their star formation rates seem to be on the rise. This was in these two surveys that Hamas mentioned at the beginning. So this is evidence at least that these galaxies are not following along this average history because they are peaking here later. Thomas used the term starburst. These are much longer than those starbursts that I was uh, working on uh, in years past. These are lasting for billions of years. So they're just a later epic of a lot of star formation. So in our study, what we did was we looked at galaxies in this region of time and looked back from there. So our two billion years would stretch further back into the evolution of galaxies. And that's what we wanted to see. How were they forming stars 
in that period because we already had indications that some of them were forming stars very rapidly. Quickly, this is uh, where a lot of these observations were made. Uh, the Magellan Telescope in Chile. Chile has some of the great sites in the world for astronomy. This is a picture of the Bada telescope, uh, the spectrograph that Tomas mentioned, IMAX, and which was used for this work. It's a large field multi-object spectrograph. You see me holding one of the plates that goes into the telescope that selects out the galaxies or stars you want to take spectra of. And it's very large field, the size of the full moon, and you get spectra of all the objects out. This particular survey was called the Carnegie Spitzer IMAX Redshift Survey. And it was unique in uh, taking very uh, moderate resolution spectra so that we could crowd lots of objects onto the field, 2,000 galaxy spectra at a time. And it was done by making a prism that is very different looking than like you normally see because it's made of sandwiches of different glass uh, that allow the, the dispersion to be pretty uniform. So here's what the little spectrum we would produce for each of these galaxies. As you can see, it's only a very short thing, but that means you can get a lot of stars. So returning to this idea that we are looking for different ages like that, in the kind of data we got, we could tell that the life from young stars would have a shape like that. That is much bluer than the star of uh, the side of the spectrum. And then a middle-aged star would be sort of a flatter distribution of light. And uh, older stars would be like that, and that's more typical of what our sun is. So they're small rainbows. They're not spread out in great detail. But they show the different shapes of the spectrum that come from the different age stars, along with the strongest absorption lines. Those are horizon stars and emission lines that come from glowing gas. We could see that stuff, uh, even though we had relatively um, low dispersion spectra. So how does this thing work? We looked at the spectra, the color of starlight, from young to middle aged and old stars, galaxy by galaxy, to test the claim that there were rising star formation rates for galaxies more than a few billion years back in time. So we analyzed the spectra of those 10,000 galaxies, and they, we were observing them at four to six billion years of look back time. So we're already back a fair ways in the universe. So for the typical uh, for the typical galaxy in our sample, we were looking at uh, something that was five billion years old. And the two billion year period we could look back, we could actually see the evolution of the stars. That went from five to seven billion years. And then there was this period from seven to 12 billion years. We could not tell the difference from older stars and even older stars. So here's a picture of a the kind of data we got, it's a spectrum, it's analogous spectrum, and the IMAX part is here, and these other boxes show measurements of uh, the light in other color. So the idea is to uh, be able to make a model that goes through these data points. Here it is, a spectra that is all old stars. And here's one that has young stars. So you can see there's a very big difference. OK, so here's how the technique works. We have a number of templates in this first 2 billion years where we could see different spectra that would correspond to different age stellar populations. The youngest group is things that are up to 200 million years old, then 200 to 500, then 500 to 1,000, and uh, which is a billion years, a gig year and one gig year to two gig years. And then beyond that, everything looks the same, so greater than two gig years. So each one of those has a template that shows what the rainbow would look like for that age uh, star cluster. And the idea is to put them together to make a good fit to what the data show. And it's a program that does that as a least squares program, sophisticated form of it, that finds the best fit by taking these five templates uh, and seeing if a combination matches. So for this particular galaxy, it turned out that the best fit was, was mostly old stars. That's what this rectangle is. And the star formation rate was something about 30 solar masses, amount of mass in the sun, per year for billions of years. 
all the way in its past. And then there was some later star formation in these other bins. Uh, it's very sensitive. And in this galaxy, it sort of had more or less a constant rate of star formation. This is the growth of the galaxy, the total mass buildup. And as you see, it was sort of going up all the time, but most of the mass was made in this early period that we cannot resolve. So let's look at some other galaxies. Here's one in which all the light comes from, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. This keyboard is very sensitive. The, all the light is coming from old stars. We can't tell how old they are, but they're older than two billion years. And it goes through all the data. On the other hand, here's one that had a big burst at the very beginning, but had some light that you can see in these templates down here that has to be added in order to get this good fit. For example, there's ultraviolet light here that you don't see here because young stars are involved. But what's interesting about this is both these galaxies are mainly made of old stars, and yet we can see the young uh, populations. We can see the old stars through the young populations. The spectrum looks very different, but in fact, uh, we could still see the old population. So over 40% of the galaxies, as most people have found, form most of their stars in the first six billion years. Another 40% had that sort of steady rise, just a constant sort of star formation. Half the stars uh, in that early period, that half in the remaining six billion years. But there was another 20%, and this is where the surprise came. We found something we wound up calling late bloomers, galaxies that form most of their stars only two billion years before they were observed, which is five billion years ago, relatively recently. This galaxy, for example, had this amount of old star formation. This is the rate of star formation. This is the buildup. It reached 40, it contributed 40% of the mass of this galaxy, but 60% came from things that were younger. And these other three examples, we detected no old stars at all. Doesn't mean they're not there, but they're probably of the 20 or 30% variety and didn't show up. And that's very surprising. It means these galaxies appear to have been born only within the two billion years before we observed them. And if they may have had some stars before that and maybe even a considerable amount, but they are dominated by that younger light. So here's a, there was 10% of our sample was, had pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this just sort of lays out what I just said. These are examples of galaxies that are truly old. All their stars were formed very early on. These are stars that grew pretty much at a constant rate like our own galaxy, would look something like that. And then there's, these are late bloomers. I've doubled the number of them here. They're, they're not 40% of all galaxies like they are in this diagram. They're only 20%. But that's an enormous amount. And these are the galaxies that seem to have been quote, born yesterday. There's some other things you could say about um, these. Uh, the late bloomers are mostly disk galaxies, but they also include some spheroidal galaxies. You could see these things here. And if you've got good eyes, you could tell that even though they look like these galaxies at the bottom, they're old, the color is different. They're whiter because they are not strictly made of stars, or like one to two billion year old stars. And a final thing to say about this is we had to convince ourselves that this result was correct because it was something we didn't, we were surprised to find, and we knew it would look very bad if it turned out we made some big mistake and we tried for an entire year to, uh, to prove ourselves wrong and we failed. But the way we did that is a very sort of classic way. We made our own galaxies. We put in our own star formation histories. Dad Kelson makes what he calls stochastic star formation histories. So we knew what the answer had to be. And the question was, could we hide a whole lot of stars that we just can't see because there's a lot of young stars in there that are blocking out? And we couldn't do that. Basically, we knew there was a great uncertainty in how much the old population was, but it was clearly less than half of the galaxy. And that was a surprise. So here's a summary. You know, ordinary galaxies kind of grow steadily through time. That's most galaxies. But according to us, 20% of galaxies went through this much later evolution. And they really did all the growth here. Uh, and then they pretty much stopped growing. They're not doing this today. 
But if you were to look around us, you should see one out of every five galaxies have this kind of a history. But you'll never be able to tell from now because of the problem I started with two giga years back, and you can't see anything more. So on this diagram, there's an old galaxy. A lot of them grow up very rapidly. There's a Milky Way, pretty much like a human being grows for the first 20 years. And there's a late bloomer getting a late start and then doing all of it in a short period of time. It's an amazing thing. Uh, we don't understand it. What prevents them, these kind of galaxies from significant star formation in the first few billion years, like most of their compatriots? Are they cases of late more uh, forming dark matter halos, uh, something like that? Do late bloomers, bloomers start to form stars early as well, but they suffer extreme feedback from star formation or massive black holes, uh, something that suppresses the star formation? We just don't know. But we can apply this sudden technique to galaxies at the beginning of the universe more effectively, in fact, but with much greater difficulty. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the final section. First light. We want to see how the first four stars form collected the galaxies and how did the first generations of stars begin the buildup of chemi heavy chemical elements. And as we said, we learned about the star formation and the abundance of heavy chemical elements from these emission spectra. We receive the glowing gas around newborn stars. So we want to know how many stars were forming at the very beginning, how rapidly, what was the abundance of heavy elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, magnesium, and phosphorus, iron, the chemistry of planets and life that started this whole thing and got us to today. So looking back here on this diagram, we saw that we could get back to within a few billion years of galaxies, but then they seem to disappear with the Hubble and the light fades. This is a picture of the deepest of the image Hubble has been able to take. And you can see these little uh, red circles are around the furthest galaxies. Redshift of 10, sort of half a billion years past the Big Bang. It's very hard to see and not much information to be had on any of them. And the reason is, the redshift is increasing, the starlight moves further into the infrared part of the spectrum, and Hubble can't see them because Hubble is blinded by its own infrared glow. There are good reasons to build a space telescope. There better be because they're very expensive. The light astronomers want to observe, uh, is, observe, observe, is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere. If that happens, like ultraviolet doesn't get through, we need a space telescope. The turbulent motions in the Earth's atmosphere blur out the sharp images. Uh, and so the Hubble Space Telescope makes much sharper images. And Hubble has really made a living out of that. But for the first time, the main reason we need a different telescope is it's too hot. How can the Hubble be too hot? It's in space. The Hubble Space Telescope is very warm. It's approximately room temperature. That does surprise you. Surprise me. So it, it's because it's in equilibrium with the Earth. It sees the Earth, the Earth is at room temperature, and so it comes to the same temperature. And it glows in the dark. Anything that is room temperature glows in the infrared, like this infrared picture here. Uh, we're familiar with this effect when we heat things up to thousands of degrees, how they glow, but it's happening around us at room temperature as well. And there's a lot of astronomy you can do because of this, things that you can't see. This is a dusty region in our galaxy, obscuring all the background stars. The pillars of Hercules, I believe this is called, a great uh, site of a very violent star formation. And if you take infrared pictures, you could see through them and find out what kind of stars are being born, for example. So how do we reach all the way back to galaxy birth? The answer is cryogenics. We have to go really cold. Cryogenic space telescopes, like the Spitzer Space Telescope, which has finished its mission recently, uh, very sensitive, but unfortunately too small to go all the way back to the first galaxies. So there will be, there is, the James Webb Space Telescope, 50 times the mirror area of the Hubble and seven times the resolution. So I have a history with this project. Very briefly, I'll tell you a story. After the launch of Hubble, it was found it had a problem with the mirror. It had been polished with extreme precision, but to the wrong shape. And the best images were very soft because of what was called uh, spherical aberration. There was great disappointment. And NASA 
planned a mid-pair mission for late 1993, but they warned us that they were not optimistic. This was the most difficult mission they had ever attempted, including landing on the moon, I was told. So at that point, uh, ORA, the Association for Universities that supports uh, the U.S. Map Optical Observatories and Space Telescope Science Institute that had just been built, sponsored a study to look in the prospects for U.S. space astrophysics if the Hubble could not be restored to its design performance, expecting in that case a shorter and much less productive mission. And they asked me to lead a committee to study possible ways forward beyond Hubble. And we began our work in 1993 after this shuttle repair mission uh, that carried a replacement camera and a corrective lens. Uh, and by the time our work was in full swing, the repair mission had become a resounding success. And the first, first months of 1994 ush ushered in this age of you know, wonder, excitement, popularity that had never been attained by a science instrument, making Hubble Space Telescope, I think, the most successful science program in history. So this HSP and Beyond Committee recognized that we had an opportunity because of the enthusiasm that Hubble had generated. We caught this wave and produced what was considered a stirring case for the buildup of Hubble's success with new goals well into the 21st century. And we brought a different approach to this, trying to look at the questions of motivations of scientists, the science and the support of society that funds this kind of work and the nature of fundamental questions. And I have a quote here, I barely really have time to read. Our other quest is as old as civilization, perhaps as old as our species. Comparing the ancient myths of many peoples tells us that the question, where did we come from, is one as cogent and profound as we can pose. For an answer, we have continually looked to the sky, the great unknown that is always figured prominently and ideas of human origins and destinies. A remarkable triumph of 20th century astronomy is the demonstration that this notion is true. Our origins and perhaps our destiny lies among the stars. The idea has already captured the imagination of a billion people. Many, many have not found it easy to follow our science, but few have missed the point. The realization is probably why we find so many modern tales linked to space, bookstore, movie listing, the television schedule, Enough to convince any of us that the, idea, the great themes of human existence are being projected into space. Our physical journeys into the cosmos may be generations into the future, but our minds already live in the space age. So we recommended that the Hubble should be supported well beyond 20, 2005, it's still going. NASA should build a space telescope with a mirror four meters or larger, optimized in the near infrared to see the first light of galaxies and develop space interferometry towards finding Earth-like worlds around other galaxies. And this gave rise to something called the Origins Program at NASA, which lasted five or six years and sort of put all this together. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, an illustration of it. It's cold, 50 degrees Kelvin or less, uh, and that is a major challenge to build. It's a different kind of telescope than we've had before. It's large, it's open, it has to be deployed. It's cryogenic and it's very powerful indeed. It has a sun shield that keeps it cold. I'm happy to show after years and years of showing uh, illustrations of, or pieces of the Hubble that this is a picture of a finished, a finished James Webb Space Telescope. But I didn't say Hubble a bunch of times there. So this is uh, fully assembled, and you'll see some pictures. Uh, this is looking at this you know, all-important sun shield that has to keep the telescope in the dark so it doesn't heat up. It has five layers that are separated by vacuum when they're in space, and it takes those five layers to step from the temperature that it would have if it were in sunlight to what it has this 50 degrees. It's quite a beautiful thing to behold. You can see here that the mirror, the side mirrors are folded because this all has to be jammed into a very tight rocket fairing. I'm going to move on. So the Hubble has to, the Hubble, the James Webb has to be put in a place where it is not being uh, heated by the Earth, the Sun, or the Moon. 
So it has this, we have a spot a million miles beyond Earth, and we have the telescope shaded by that big umbrella, which is sort of the size of uh, a tennis court. And this is the sunny side, and then this is the dark side, which is looking out in the space. It's a big telescope compared to Hubble and much bigger than Spitzer. And it'll get all jammed into this rocket. Uh, and then it will deploy. And I have a, some pictures of this, but I think I'll probably cut it short to get to the last bit of science. But that's the solar panels coming out. That's the communications antenna. That's the sun shield being deployed on one side. And then the other, it turned out that fabricating this sun shield and getting it to work reliably, and it must, because if it fails, the mission will suffer greatly, uh, was uh, very, very tricky. I think the mirrors have been finished for the telescope uh, for six or seven years, but the sun shield has been worked on right into this last six months. So that's what it does. And you'll see these things pop out from each other so you can see it's a pretty complicated uh, deployment. I don't think anything like this has ever been done. And that's why it took so long. This telescope we got sort of started in 2000 and it's now 2020. And it's costed a bundle. So you see the layers eventually are spaced out to provide the insulation it needs to keep the telescope cold. And the last thing that happens is the Secondary mirror comes out, deploys, and then the Hubble, uh, the, the, the mirrors of James Webb hold out. I'm working with the NIRCAM team. Uh, there are three instruments, uh, infrared camera, a spectrograph, uh, mid-infrared image camera and spectrograph. And um, we have a joint collaboration between the NIRCAM and the NIRSPEC team to study galaxies in first light. So it's these galaxies that look like this with the Hubble that we really are going to focus on. Maybe they're going to look something like this. These are merging galaxies in our modern times. But because these are mature galaxies, they probably don't give us much of an idea of what this very dynamic and chaotic first time was, is going to look at, look like. Um, here are some examples of what uh, younger galaxies, maybe these are the kinds of things we'll see. Um, but again, we don't know, are these the predecessors for uh, you know, ancestors of spiral galaxies or elliptical galaxies? We really don't know. So I think I will skip here the ex exact description of what we're going to do, um, but we're going to take very deep fields like, like Hubble did, um, the, read the James Webb's deep fields, uh, and it will address questions like, what did the first galaxies look like? How did binoculars and masses grow in the first 100 million years? And how does this crowded, gas-rich, highly dynamic or explosive environment uh, in which galaxies were born shape what they are today? So I'm going to use those images, which are uh, it will be the deep images, which we've taken in nine bands to make sort of spectra again, energy distributions, to see what the star formation histories were for the first galaxies. And because the universe is less than a billion years old, we no longer have to worry about all the stars that look alike because we have only this period when the light is changing very rapidly with age to um, figure out what the, uh, uh, the rate of star formation has been in that galaxy. So here's what the data are going to look like. This is the analogous of what we were seeing before with IMAX. This is what an infrared uh, spectrum will look like, the nine bands that will be measured by uh, the NIRCAM deep imaging. And there's a very different looking one. And here you see a star formation history uh, that has been extracted from FITI. This in just the same way. There are templates for each different age group. And we get this fit, which is this pink line here, magenta line. And that fit determines what the star formation history is like. Uh, Kevin Hainline from Arizona made a series of mock galaxy spectra by putting in a star formation history. And then I ran my least squares program to try to recreate it. So this is actually obscuring. These are two bursts of star formation that were put in. And the three squares indicate 
what my program said the history of the galaxy was. There's a blue arrow at a hidden here. Each model he made has two bursts of star formation and then the beginning of continuous star formation. This is one in which what we put in was exactly what came out, two bursts and continuous star formation. Here's another one where, in fact, the two bursts are seen as one. The star formation uh, begins a little bit earlier, but this is pretty good agreement. We're seeing the whole history of this galaxy back to 12, 13, 14 billion years uh, from just getting one measurement. These galaxies are like five, six, seven billion years back, not as far back. But we can see back to the beginning. This is just a little test to show you that uh, if we take the bursts out, the spectrum looks different, and there's there's no aliasing here. There's no the bursts disappear. That's the kind of test you have to make. And here are just some more examples showing uh, how uh, we will extract different histories uh, when we see different. Things like this. It's going to be hard because the galaxies are faint, and in many cases there will be ambiguities, but we're going to learn something. So I'm working on that project, and uh, the Hubble is the Hubble. <laughs> I've got to figure out why that is. The James Webb Space Telescope will be launched in October, and it's going to uh, do marvelous things. We should start getting these kind of images maybe six months, eight months later. They'll be released. So all the astronomers and I will uh, start working with those images to try to get uh, uh, a history of the star formation for first light, at least that. And we're going to pick objects with those images that will be studied with the near-spec instrument to look at the chemical evolution, which I really haven't had time to talk about. So here are my takeaways. Galaxies are built from generations of stars, star birth. Some began and finished in a couple of billion years, but most have had long age of the universe histories of building up enormous masses of stars and heavy chemical elements needed to make planets where life can rise and flourish. It's difficult to decode a star formation history in our own time. When we step back a few billion years and use the spectra to dissect the stellar populations in earlier galaxies, we have better leverage on the past and we can begin we begin to see a diverse collection of histories, including galaxies that apparently started much later than we expected. We call late bloomers. The Hubble Space Telescope took us to the threshold of galaxy birth, but we need this big, super cold James Webb Space Telescope to reveal the infant galaxies whose infrared light comes to us very faintly from the beginning of the modern universe. That's when the universe became the universe we live in. The cradles of galaxy birth are not going to give up their secrets easily, but histories of star formation should be easier to unravel when all the stars will be young so that their spectra change rapidly to reflect their recent histories. So as we reach the centennial of the discovery of galaxies, the Webb telescope and its likely successor, an even larger telescope that will specialize in discovering Earth-like worlds, the other part of our origins. In our corner of the Milky Way, well, that should be by mid-century should resolve these age-old puzzles about the key steps in our origins. So thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Alan. Beautiful talk. So we have plenty of excellent questions in the Q&A. Um, let's start with the first one from uh, Sandy Faber, who is asking, do we still have late bloomers today and how would we see them? And what um, an additional question would be is, what is the mass function of these late bloomers in the nearby universe? And then as they go back in, into high redshift space, um, does that mass function of these late bloomers change with evolution? Well, I guess because Sandy was my advisor, she gets to ask all the questions she wants to. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, no, they don't exist today because we would see in the present day, we would see star formation at a lot high level in galaxies looking back just to a billion years, and we don't. Um, when we get, we have a plot showing sort of the frequency of these things, and they go from being 20% uh, for five, six billion years ago to essentially zero today, and very steeply does that come down. So uh, there was an era when this was possible, probably had something to do with gas 
fractions and galaxies of fuel for making new stars. No, not sure, we really don't understand. Let's see, it was also, she also asked about the, they, they are fairly massive. I mean, they go up, they tend to be a little less massive on average, but they cover a big mass range and they're not dwarfish galaxies at all. Everything you saw was more massive than say, uh, M33 and was there, was there a third part? No, that was, I think, the, the mass function question. So my, my additional question to that would be about the morphology, which you just mentioned. And you could somewhat see that in the images that you've shown, right? They, are, they all have like disky morphologies. But Is not all. And in fact, I think the big surprise for us, we didn't know we had Sandy's, uh, it was Sandy's uh, survey um, that had gotten those Hubble images. And we didn't, I, I think, know that we overlapped with that in some point. So we hadn't these images until quite late in the study. And I must say it was a tremendous disappointment when we saw all these late bloomers look just like normal galaxies, because that was really puzzling. How could they start late and wind up doing, looking indistinguishable? So they have some differences, but they're not differences of kind. They're just differences in degree. And there are things that look pretty much like elliptical galaxies, but they're full of A stars, I mean, uh, young stars. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, let's go to the panel. Um, should we start with Yara? Yes. Thanks. And thanks, Alan, for a great talk. I wanted to ask you, since you've also worked a lot on, on galaxy evolution uh, with environment, I wanted to ask you about what is the environment of these late bloomers and your take in general of how you fit environment in this picture of the star, different star formation histories of galaxies. Yes, I, you know, I've been associated most of my career with this morphology density relation, which people have interpreted to be that it all happens late, that the environment has an effect of transforming galaxies. But in fact, from the day I first found that relation, I've always thought it had more to do with that the density was higher when they were born in the early universe, and they carried that signature and a destiny with them. Um, these things, I can tell you that late bloomers are not in dense regions. So that tells you something. And, you know, I guess that probably makes sense that when galaxies are going to form rapidly, they, they are in places where there's, you know, high density. Uh, on the, and we also found that they are more likely to be near other late bloomers. They have a higher probability to be near other late bloomers and never in a dense region. And we can't figure out really what that tells us. But there's a clear signature. It's the kind of thing you can't get wrong just doing a correlation function. So if there is a late bloomer around, it is more likely that some other girl, uh, than another one could have formed in that same environment. But what it is about that environment that makes that possible is a mystery. Thank you, good question. Miguel, do you want to take your question? Yeah. I'm going to ask the question to the Alan Dressler's alter ego after saying what a wonderful talk. Alan Dressler is a well-known instrument designer, builder, and involved with big projects. So how do you envision the interaction from what you're going to learn from the web telescope with the giant telescopes that are supposed to be working by the end of this decade? And in particular, the JMT, to which you will have Lots of access. I would, uh, I think, imagine that almost all the complementarity is going to come in the spectroscopy, higher resolution spectroscopy that's going to chart the chemical evolution. That's going to be possible with uh, James Webb with the near spec, but uh, there are limits to how high a you know, detail one can get uh, and also how faint you can go. And it's going to be, you know, the spectroscopy is always more difficult in terms of getting enough light. And I think that's where the Diamond Dome telescope, uh, 30 meter telescope, uh, are going to provide absolutely essential information that combined with the images and these other sort of more approximate ways of dating the generations of stars, uh, that's going to be needed to flesh out the whole picture. Tomaso? Yeah, I'll ask a question to another one of Alan's alter egos. 
talent that are visionary. So, you know, you prove that you are very good at that with the you know, Hubble and Beyond report. But now I have a question that your analogy with human beings make me think about, and this is something you and I and Louis has discussed before. Like, we are still in an exploration stage, but at some point we, we would have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to understand galaxy formation and evolution? What do you think, when, when would you be satisfied if we understand galaxy formation and evolution? What does that mean for you? That's a very good question. I, you know, I mentioned this thing about the, this Lily Mel diagram and the fact that people said, oh, we know what the average galaxy does, and that seems sufficient. And for many people, particularly theorists, not all of them, uh, that was sufficient. They thought, we do know enough. I don't really care about the differences between this galaxy and that galaxy. Uh, I think Simon White said, that's just weather. You know, I'm interested in climate, but I'm not interested in the weather. I don't feel I have to be able to predict that. It's just a variation I'm not interested in. So I guess minimally, I would like to know if there are different histories, what is behind driving, the, what physics is behind driving this history. Uh, it seems difficult to imagine that we will have the kind of detail, we won't, about those early galaxies that we could do in nearby galaxies where we could take them apart star by star. We can ask questions about how they incorporated other galaxies around them and merging them and rip them apart. So I don't expect that we have to hold out for that. Uh, we're going to try to analogize between the, the very detailed observations we have today and the much more uh, qualitative, but in a sense, completely uh, unprecedented kind of things we'll see at the very beginning. So I think we have to, to say we're finished, we have to be able to sort of explain how it all got started to lead to this and what is all the variation we see in between. But uh, I'm kind of optimistic that by 2050 with these instruments, we will uh, achieve that and that the focus will really go into the more uh, origin of life and uh, planets and such. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you, Tomasa. Now, Maurizio. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Uh, you uh, gave a very nice overview about, uh, you know, the properties and the evolution of galaxy, what we know and we don't know. So picking up from question also from the audience, uh, galaxies carry also an imprint of the universe we live in. So what is your feeling uh, of how they trace the universe, for instance, in the sense of the type of dark matter that we have in the universe, how gravity works, how would they be different if the ingredients are changed? Well, I made this rather, you know, extreme statement without galaxies, the universe would get over um, because of the complexity. Uh, I think that's a fair statement. I mean, it depends on how you want to, uh, where you think you want to turn the knobs to change how the universe turns out, whether you do it in the first 10 to the minus 24 seconds or uh, later in inflation or something like that. I guess I, I would have to say that uh, the dark, the cold dark matter scenario is, is, is incredibly successful because uh, just by assuming that the matter is cold, you get a very good map of the structure on a large scale. You see where galaxies are located, how they're, uh, they correlate with in, in space with each other, and it matches very well um, the uh, what we see in computer simulations where we just start out with, with the dark matter. I feel that the attempts to make galaxies on those things have been much less successful because they really have uh, only reproduced what we already knew, what galaxies look like and how they form stars and all those kind of things. Uh, they haven't really predicted anything about star formation and galaxy growth we didn't know before. Um, but when it comes to the large scale structure of the universe, I think they've been very successful. I don't know if that really answers the question, but I think it's important for everybody to realize that uh, the large scale structure of the universe uh, may be close to a solved problem. Felipe, do you want to take yes. a question? Is there a follow up on that? Let me understand, Felipe, what you actually. 
No, I'm satisfied. It's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks, Alan, for you know a beautiful talk. I have a couple of questions. And um, uh, do you see or expect a, a difference, significant difference in the chemical evolution of you know the galaxies in the bulk of you know the cosmic star formation epoch and the late bloomers? And, and if that's so, uh, I, you know, having a question from, from the, the Q&A, Rodrigo Feitas asks, does the peak uh, in cosmic star formation history imposes a minimum cosmic age for galaxies to be habitable? So if you can relate those, it would be great. Yeah. By the way, uh, the second part of that thing, I thought about that a lot, a long time ago, but uh, this question of when is the universe first habitable, when does the heavy elements get up to the point where we can have planets, we, that's the kind of life we know about, may not be all that there could be. Um, but that's got to be pretty early. I think almost any way you sort it out, you can see that in some places in the universe, it becomes rather modern looking with solar abundances of heavy chemical elements within that billion, certainly the first billion years. Um, and so I don't know what to say about the late bloomers. We talked about that uh, around here. Um, we haven't really made the kind of detailed measurements that we need to do. My suspicion is it's not going to look very different because uh, these galaxies probably formed in places that have not been, uh, I don't want to say polluted, but have not been, uh, had heavy elements dumped on them. So they're probably starting from scratch, pretty much like galaxies born much earlier. And we know that the uh, galaxies look very much the same. So it seems like they are going through, you know, the same processes. Like, you know, like I said, we were very surprised and worried when we didn't see very different looking galaxies. But then again, you have to ask, well, this is what happens when you put matter, you know, baryonic matter together with dark matter and you, you know, have make molecular clouds. Maybe it's all very, very similar, uh, regardless of when you started. If that's true, the only question is, why didn't it start at the beginning with everything else? And that's a that's a possible. But we need to make those measurements. They're not be, they're not beyond uh, uh, our ability to get very detailed spectra and see if we do see something different uh, in heavy elements, abundances, and cetacean and things. Uh, we're going to do that, or somebody's going to do it, if not me. There is a question from Demetra from the audience in YouTube. Yes, hi Alan, thank you for the talk. Uh, the question was asked by Enrico Kondu and it says, hi, wonderful talk. Just out of curiosity, if once in space, the mirror of JWST does not open, will the telescope be able to work with only the central part of the mirror correctly position positioned? I am happy to say yes. And that in fact was one of the winning uh, parts of that design that won the contract um, for, uh, um, <laughs> change their name three times. Uh, the idea was that if they had to, there were some very much more complicated ways of almost like dealing the mirrors out, like uh, dealing a hand of cards, separate segments which would spin out and then lock together. Those are the kind of things we were thinking of because they're the, the space that the mirror would have to be, uh, this big cylinder that the rocket has, and not very big, it's not anywhere near the size of the mirror. So a lot of people thought about making segments that were stacked and somehow putting it all together. And then this design came that said, well, just fold the thing uh, you know, like that and you can fit it into a cylinder and it has the advantage if it doesn't work, you still have about, I think, 65% of the mirror. So you know, that would be really great. <laughs> I know that doesn't happen, but uh, there are many deployments on this telescope, things that has to happen in the first months as they you know, unfurl everything. And that's got some people very worried. Uh, on the other hand, that's what really it's taken the extra years uh, that they have worked on this. Uh, there is a great uh, desire never to repeat anything like happened at, at the spherical aberration in Hubble. And uh, so they have been super careful and tested things again and again and again. But I think that was a really smart move. When I saw that, I thought, those are smart guys. Thank you. 
Gustavo, do you want to make your question? Yes. Hi, Alan. Nice to see you. Gustavo, nice to see you. Do you know anything of the dark matter content of these galaxies? Are they normal or they have more or less dark matter than they should? Or? Well, I was speculating that the only thing that you can imagine is that the density perturbations that uh, gave rise to these uh, were places in the universe where um, there was a broad but shallow sort of dark matter uh, distribution. Same, same amount of total matter, but not as peak, that maybe that kind of a thing would be more easily disrupted from star formation or something. I, I must say, I rather desperate to come up with some solution. I don't think I have it. But um, there's no right reason to believe that they don't have the same proportion of dark matter to normal matter. Uh, you could measure that at this point, you know, you could do with potassium person based. But I would be surprised. Again, the morphology tells you something that it must be a very similar process. And the morphology has to be related to the dark blood cell. Thank you. I think it'll be the same. More of the mystery. Yes, sir. Thanks, Paula. So, Alan, nice to see you again. And thanks for the talk. It was very, very refreshing. So, I have uh, two questions. One question is melt question and comment. Uh, so, these uh, bloomers, uh, you say that uh, they are not located in very dense environments. And also you say that uh, there seems to be nothing special in, 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 in sense of, uh, of the shape of the galaxies. I wonder if these galaxies are the current closest brightness galaxies we see today. Uh, can we discard that or not? That, that's the first question. And uh, the second one, I will, I will put that immediately, is related to the, to the James Webb telescope in case of repair. If something failed, compared to HST, HST is just at 500 kilometers uh, there up in the, in, the, in, the, in the sky. But James Webb will be at 1.5 million kilometers. So is NASA envisioned something to repair or to go there for something that has to be attended or, or not? This is a second question. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first question, no, they don't become the brightest galaxies. It, the, this epoch at which we found late bloomers uh, is they rise and they stop forming stars because we know the phenomenon doesn't continue to today. So, no, they tend to be average galaxies, maybe on the short side, if anything. Uh, um, that's, you know, I wanted to say that there is a very simple test that involves measuring the star formation in a galaxy and then how much mass it has in it and asking the question how long did it take to make that mass so when i mentioned that there were these cases of uh galaxies that were a few billion years back that looked like they have rising star formation rates the key to that is that they had high rates of star formation but had accumulated not very much mass i told you they hadn't been doing this for very long they weren't starbursts it was longer than that but it said that, and that measurement is very simple. And even though we doubt the more complicated analysis we have, how does it, how do we get late bloomers? The fact that that is also true, and that's what started us, makes me think it must be right. Because it's very easy to measure the star formation rate and the total mass and say, this couldn't have been making stars very long. Very interesting. Uh, the, the, uh, I see, thanks. And the James Webb, the question was, I knew it, I forgot. What was the James Webb question? I uh, was uh, in, in the case that uh, something oh. failed that, that needs yeah. repair, uh, how That's... NASA envisioned to do that. <laughs> I <laughs> sat through a lot of uh, dis you know, discussions about that, and people talked until fairly late in the game about putting some sort of uh, you know, way to grasp the telescope. There was actually talk that maybe it could be brought back to the Earth, uh, to the moon, uh, Earth moon Lagrange point, that someday in the future there might be a station. In fact, there is a thing called the portal that NASA has been talking about having a, a, a service for all kinds of things uh, that's around the moon. And the, uh, the amount of energy it takes to move something from the L2 of the Earth sun system to the Earth moon is very small. So you could actually imagine 
grabbing onto the thing and with a fairly small rocket, very slowly haul it back in where you could work on it. Uh, but they didn't do it. I mean, <laughs> I think in the end, they, they really felt that, uh, you know, it was one good shot and we had to learn how to do those things. And after all, we send things to Mars, we send lots of complicated things, maybe not this expensive. Uh, and we get the idea that they have to work the first time and, and that's it. Okay, Whether good luck. <laughs> I'll bet that the, that the next telescope, if we build something to look for Earth-like worlds, is going to be serviceable, robotically at least. Thank you very much. Thanks. That is a question from the Q&A from Carlos Oscar Rodriguez Leal. He's asking, how could the future evolution of the galaxy, the galaxies be according to the different models of the future of the universe? You mean like the really apocalyptic sort of models of death? <laughs> um, I'm not an expert about this. Uh, with present cosmology, I think we believe that the universe will kind of coast to a stop. Um, but I guess it's always possible that there is some residual out of balance that would cause it to either expand indefinitely or, or collapse, but very finely balanced, that's for sure. Uh, I think by the time any of that happens, galaxies will be pretty much out of gas. So I don't think they will be forming new stars and the kinds of things we think of as typical of the galaxy already are beginning to sort of fade by this epoch. We see galaxies changing. I don't think that necessarily means that it's the end of everything because I think once you have life, uh, you have the potential for, if you work against entropy, you could more or less continue to have a future um, even in that environment. But I think it'll be hard to have galaxies in their conventional way because all the pieces will sort of be gone in the conditions. It's a hard question, thank you. <laughs> Valentina, do you want to? Yes, uh, Alan, thank you so much for this nice talk. And it's very inspiring for us, uh, for the future research we will uh, perform with a James Webb, James Webb telescope. So uh, I have a question about uh, nowadays, we know that there are two main mechanisms by which uh, galaxies gain gas. So by infalling gas from the cosmic web or by merging of galaxies. So uh, with James Webb, uh, we will go deeper on the uh, determination of at which rate, which of the processes is more prominent than the other uh, through cosmic time. It will help us to, to, uh, to determine this. Um, I'm really glad you brought this up because I didn't have time to talk about where the gas comes from at all. And it's so, um, it's so essential to this process. Um, I let the, you know, just let the impression that it was all in the galaxy sitting there in the disk being used up. But in fact, we know, as you say, that galaxies are, are creating gas from their surroundings, and then they also are blowing gas out. And it's a fascinating field, one of the most interesting fields in astrophysics and one of the most the fastest growing and trying to understand that exchange. And it probably has major effect on it everything, including maybe even the late bloomer kind of stuff. But yes, uh, I think that that will, uh, the doing the gas uh, structure will come more from the big ground-based telescopes, even to these very uh, high redshifts by making these kind of uh, maps where you use galaxies as, background galaxies as sight lines to, to illuminate the gas and to see where it is relative to where the galaxies are to make these maps. Uh, I don't think the James Webb, despite its power, doesn't have, I think, the, uh, the high enough dispersion uh, and the background sources. Uh, I don't think it's as well suited as, for example, the big, the next generation of gigantic ground-based telescopes. That's one of the cases that was made for building them, was to turn to not so much studying the, the stars in the galaxies, but the gas part of the universe. So I think that is going to be a huge area for growth, but I don't think, could be wrong about this, but I don't think James Webb is going to be the instrument of choice. You know, it's always a matter, too, of what does the, pro what does the problem best? 
sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, you know, even if it could, it might be that it would be so inefficient in doing it that you would want to spend the time on one of the things it does really well, which is the star part of it and not on the gas. I'll have to think about that. Thank you for the good question. Thank you. Okay, Thomas. Yeah, I mean, I want to I want to take up this thread from Valentina and and pull it a little bit further and weave it into a beautiful knot of a meta question <laughs> combined with other threads from the Q and A here um, that that are massively inspiring about um, so the the fuel for star formation right we we sort of again discover this right now where where the fresh fuel is and we very well i would say understand what the local uh, group is doing in terms of its star formation history by means of resolved stellar population studies so if you in your modeling of these star formation histories right the ingredients that you're taking um, are always calibrated on the local universe right the chemical enrichment history the population synthesis models that right we have a world expert here with us gustavo brusual is is putting them together, right? If you if you take this, right, you're locking yourself to the formation and evolution history of galaxies in the environmental type of the local universe. Do you think that these late bloomers in your modeling of their star formation histories might actually have an aspect to them, like a very bizarre chemical enrichment pattern, let's say just being fueled by fresh primordial gas in a very metal you know depleted or metal poor um, star formation mode that we just you know haven't seen and you basically discovered this as and call them in a sense of the framework of the local volume star formation model ingredients late bloomers and do you think we have to somewhat adapt our understanding and broaden maybe our modeling when we go to the high redshift universe when we you know have to worry about IMF, um, the cumulative IMF, uh, you know, enrichment patterns, what, what outflow energies of the different feedback mechanisms we have to deal with. Is there, you know, is there like, let's say, room for more broader speculation than just calling these galaxies late bloomers? Okay, fair question. Um, I don't think the ages, since they tend to rest on O and B and A stars, and their kind of evolution is pretty simple compared to less massive stars. I don't think that part of it is in danger of, uh, well, they wouldn't look like that. It's kind of what the metal is. And the other thing I guess I would say about that is we have studied a lot of galaxies back to four or five and six billion years. Uh, and, you know, people are surprised how much they look like modern galaxies. That it's after that, earlier than that, when uh, things really start to change. On the other hand, you know, I certainly think you are absolutely right when you met, you put that kind of uh, concern into studying the first galaxies, uh, because then we are going to see very different conditions and very different uh, metal abundance patterns. I, mean, I would, uh, if Gustavo uh, would like to come into this, I would, uh, would like to comment from him. Gustavo, would you like to comment on this? Well, not really. I, I was wondering what's, what makes this galaxy so different. They, they look like, people call them delay systems. Right? For some yeah. reason, they, they didn't start uh, on the proper. Yeah. Maybe there was not enough hydrogen. Or they were in, in a place without a very uh, deep uh, gravitational world. But apparently, after they overcome the delay, they seem to be similar. I don't know. Do we know anything of the alpha enhancement in these galaxies? Are they yeah. reaching? But that's a that's a great thing to do. I mean, what what Gustavo is referring to is that uh, there are tip offs about uh, aging of populations based on uh, the alpha elements in the periodic table uh, showing up first from massive stars and then the iron and heavier elements showing up later billions of years so seeing if that pattern looks the same in these things which are supposedly much younger is a great idea 
and it's, it's going to be hard, but maybe with the next gen telescopes that are big enough, you could get those kind of spectra you need to really get the, the chemical signatures for all the elements. We're not doing anything like that yet. Not at that distance, I think. And they shouldn't have too much dust either, right? Or yeah, that's true. That's easier to tell, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. Good question. Gaspar? Thanks, uh, Thomas. This is a little bit uh, different from the other questions, but uh, I can't, uh, I can't uh, contain myself to, to ask. Uh, you, uh, Alan, are a very good writer, too, for great audiences. You wrote uh, many years ago a book named uh, Voyage to the Great Attractor, right? And uh, so uh, are you thinking to write another book? for the next generations and people, I mean, the millennials, pandemials, and all the young, um, most of them are hearing this, this talk. So can you tell us something about that? Um, I've, I've had a book outlined for a long time and had get into the reasons why it is written, but I wanted to amplify this idea, um, which seemed important at the time of the group, uh, which is a great attractor. Uh, I noticed that when I would get on airplane flights, as most astronomers used to in those days, <laughs> not now, uh, I'd sit next to people and I would, you know, tell them the story of the things that I worked on, and it, it uh, surprised me uh, how often people said almost word for word, gee, it's so vast, it makes me feel so insignificant. And, you know, and that was not what my aim was, telling them about all the things that humans had discovered about the universe. I was always upset to hear them say something like that. And I would go into this kind of spiel about, well, you know, I'm telling you this because we are significant in this place, places like this where there is life and there is con uh, consciousness and the ability to look at the universe and know the universe is what it's all about. So in some very fundamental way, the, the, the Copernican revolution, which took us away from the center of the solar system and away from the center of the, of the galaxy and away from the center of the, all those things, I think it comes back and it says the, the focus comes back to, this, to us. We are the center in a way that's much more meaningful than the geography. It's about what goes on in the universe, the conscious, the thought, the life. There may be other centers, it's not the only one, but it is a very central location. And you know, it's important for us to feel that way because we're endangering the planet and our whole civilization. Uh, we have to feel that we're not insignificant, but it's all very important that we have done this and we get through this period uh, to make sure that it never goes away. That's kind of what I wanted to write. Uh, I'm still, trying to put it all in the context of what's going on in the world and uh, what people think of scientists. And uh, that seemed like something they might want to hear more. Um, you know, I, I have to say Carl Sagan is one of my heroes and uh, he wanted to Im imbue people that sense of humility about the universe. You know? And I'm afraid that he actually encouraged people to sort of feel insignificant. It wasn't his intent. Um, but I think it's important to get that message out uh, that we matter and therefore our existence matters. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe this I'll is, write. This is the, the initial, yeah. you know. <laughs> Somebody should write it, but not me. I hope, I hope we will see this book from you at some point. It would be. It would be a pleasure to read. Wonderful. OK, let's wrap this up here. Thank you so much, Alan, for a wonderful talk and wonderful Q&A. Thank you, panelists, for asking great questions and being around. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for being here with us and asking also great questions in the Q&A. So we will forward the questions, of course, to Alan, and then we can follow up on them. Um, after the talk, please be so kind and generous to fill out the survey that we put in the, in the website in front of you. And I would like to announce the next golden webinar, which will be on March 19th uh, by Sabine Hossenfelder. 
who is a theoretical physicist and a research fellow at the Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies. And she will talk about, is dark matter real? So that's quite interesting. <laughs> okay, so I hope you can join us then next week again. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and until the next golden webinar in astrophysics. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.